Um, Richard, say when you refer to Abbott, uh, former Abbott Eisenshank, uh, he is now and has been disclosed as a known offender and included in the letter uh, and uh, revealed uh, both to us and to others. Uh, you say that you sent a letter to Abbott Kloss in October of this year. In November, yes. I mean, yes. Uh, and identified Abbott Timothy, former Abbott Timothy Kelly, Father Kelly, now deceased, as the offender in that, in that letter, correct? Uh, yes, he was the object of the complaint. And that was before we announced um, and required them to come clean with the known offenders who had worked and were former abbots and or former priests and or former monks and or former brothers who were known offenders at St. John's. When you say you believe that uh, the um, uh, Institute was a part of the cover-up, uh, what was Abbott Kelly's role with the Institute? Well, Abbott Kelly got some inspiration from Abbott Timothy, uh, excuse me, uh, from Abbott Jerome. Abbott Jerome really wanted to do something about this. And he and I were good friends, very classmates from way back. He talked to me often, how are we going to handle the sex education, the monks, and so on. He got elected to a position in Rome. Timothy took over from that. And so on the impetus of Jerome's uh, force, this program went through. Patrick Carnes was also uh, very uh, influential in this. And so they set this program up that was supposed to do something. And Abbot Timothy gave a beautiful statement when we were first all together about, first of all, he wanted to do something with the monastery uh, if there was any problem there. And as the months went on and the years went on, it was cover up, cover up, cover up. And the people I reported to Abbot Timothy or the reports that I transmitted to him, he dismissed. He did not follow up on one of them. And I became kind of a persona non grata. In fact, I have been told that I have the distinction of causing all the problems at St. John's. Well, there's many that take, would take issue with that, Richard. Uh, we included. Uh, the statement of, of former Abbot Kelly and what he said about uh, this uh, issue in 1994, because when you contrast what he said uh, to what we now know he did to this child, this youth, I should say, and evidently many others, uh, and contrast that to what has been disclosed by the Abbey, we see three different horrors. Abuse, lies, and cover-up. And it's sad that we're here again delivering the same message um, that has been spoken of and addressed and continues to try to be addressed by the courageous survivors that he is yet to be. Um, that's it. Patrick. I want to tell a couple stories of how the, the rubber meets the road on the cover-up, especially uh, around, uh, around the time of ISTE and you know the early 90s were really rough at St. John's. We had you know multiple complaints coming in at, at all different times. A lot of us, our entire lives were changed. Uh, we were sent into assignments we were not prepared for, we were ordained early, all kinds of things were going on. And one of the classic stories that made no sense, but we took on faith, that uh, while, we, you know, in, while we were junior monks in the 80s, we were told the reason Abbot John Eidenschenk never came around is because he was mad about not being re-elected the abbot. And the real reason, the reason he hung out as a uh, nursing home chaplain for years, not too far from St. John's, and never appeared in public again, 
Obviously, it's because of all the accusations that he was sexually active. That was the story that we were told as young monks. It was not the truth. We were told stories, uh, notes would go up on the abbot's bulletin board. You know, Father Tom has gone off to alcohol treatment. I learned personally from the monk's parents that that's not what Father Tom was going off for. Another classic example of, of how things were gearing up at the Abbey um, and, and why many documents may not exist is in December, I don't even know if I told you this, in December of 1992, after Christmas, after we got back from you know, going out to cover parishes at Christmas time, we had a three-day seminar from a canonist, a civil lawyer, and a psychologist on what is the civil justice system. What does a civil complaint look like? What does it mean when you're in a parish and a subpoena shows up? What are the proper document destruction policies that we need to have in place? All of this was started in 1992 and at, at the, you know, the, the push and the thrust of Abbot Timothy. Patrick, you're a, uh, obviously a former monk. You also mentioned the canon law. You are also a canon lawyer. Canon lawyer, are you not? Yes. It, uh, what is a canon lawyer, and what does the canon law uh, have to do with sexual abuse and cover-up? Well, canon law is simply the tradition of the discipline, the legal discipline of the church. It's all about minimums. Remember how you had to, you remember as kids probably growing up about how, you know, exactly how much you must fast and how long is the fast days and exactly how many ounces you can eat and still maintain the fast, all those kinds of things. What is a Sunday obligation? Uh, the, the Code of Canon Law also has a criminal division, a penal division. And the knowledge of childhood sexual abuse goes back into the fourth century. So all you do is you take the current code, the 1983 code, you look at 1395.2 and you talk about the sexual abuse of a minor by a priest under the age of 16. Wow. So then you look at the legislative history and you chase it back into 2359 in the 1917 code. And then you start to chase it back through the different papal teachings. And then you chase it back further into the meetings of the bishops throughout the centuries. And there has been a continuous flow of legal teaching by the Pope and the bishops in, in Congress about the sexual abuse of minors by priests. In my little world, if you have a law, if you have a rule in your house, it's because somebody has busted the boundaries of what is acceptable. And if the church has a rule going into the Council of Elvira, about what to do when a priest sexually abuses a child, not if, but when, that gives us an incredible corporate knowledge. And that to take it a step further, the reason it's important to be able to, to have a history or a knowledge of the law is because we also have another word for it in monasticism, it's called monk's disease. Monk's disease has been known for a long time, it's just another way to express the long-term knowledge that monks and priests sexually abuse kids. It's part of the fabric of the culture. And if, if there's anything I hope that we do with all these decades of labor, is that we start to break that fabric. We stop it. We stop it at the school level, we stop it at the parish level, and we stop the bishops from being able to cover it up. In the, in the church law and the canon law, when an abbot or a superior gets a report or a document that shows a monk or a priest has abused, what does the code or the church law require the superior or the abbot to do with that evidence? He's required to act, first of all. He's required to do an investigation. There, this is not one of those, it's a if call. He has to investigate. And depending on which decade we're talking about, the abbot then, if he is the one who's accused and he gets that information, he needs to recuse himself and tell the abbot primate. He needs to go up the chain. He needs to go to, to Rome. 
Now, one of the problems we've had over, over time is that even some of the Abbott primates, like Rembert Weakland, unfortunately, were abusers themselves. So it, it does. It goes all the way up the chain. They're supposed to do investigations, but all the power resides in that one particular person. Does the code require that this all be kept secret? Tell us how that is required to be kept secret. It's called the pontifical secret. Confidentiality is another word that, that's used, but the pontifical secret is very clear. When you're doing these investigations, and I did them, you have to sign off. You have to sign off on the pontifical secret that under penalty of excommunication, you will not speak of it. It doesn't matter if you're the notary in the room who's taking the notes. It doesn't matter if you're the promoter of justice. If you're the defender of the, of, the, of the bond, the defender of the priest, if you're involved in the process, you got to sign off on it. And the culture is secret. And they don't care what your civil laws are. you got to remember that the church was here long before this particular jurisdiction of civil law and the English common law came around, and they believe they're going to be here long after. And in, in the case of a conflict of law, they believe that the code, canon law, and the divine law, scripture, prevails. So if there, is a, if there is a question, you follow the code, the church law, not the civil law. And that's what they've been consistently doing over the years. Now you're gonna find remnants in the files. Every once in a while you'll find a, you know, a telephone conversation. You'll find a uh, laicization, involuntary laicization decree is extremely helpful because you find out everything that they knew about the priest before they dismissed him from the clerical state. And I, I think that the important thing also that happens is this stuff gets memorialized. These documents do exist. However, a lot of them get shipped to Rome. And they're sitting with uh, Cardinal Levada and uh, with the new review of uh, the law in 2001, prior to that, for as Benedictines, it would have sat at the uh, Congregation for the Institutes of Consecrated Life. These documents do exist. I'm going to ask you, Patrick, and you, Richard, to make a final observation. But before you do, uh, does anybody have any other questions of these gentlemen may have a broad and deep experience in this area? To the best of your knowledge, what's the current status of this institute? Is it dead, dormant? Um, uh, you mean the uh, ISTI? Yeah. Yes. ISTI is absolutely dead. Absolutely dead. And if you read, some of the letters of resignation, I believe there's a woman by the name of Elizabeth Horst, uh, but who wrote letters and told them how deceived they felt. And I know some of the psychiatrists uh, who resigned from the board uh, who felt it was not only a sham, but they felt personally used and deceived. It is a nothing. I'd like to make one statement that you've probably all read about this report that the John Jay, uh, the criminal, um, College of Criminal Justice has published uh, for the bishops uh, about the context and the cause of sexual abuse. They have put the context and the cause in broad society and outside the church. Any of us who have worked on this know that the context is the, sec is the uh, culture within the clergy, within, which is a secret culture that covers uh, the Pope and the bishops very much. That is the context in which a priest operates. And the cause comes from the top. I will say that again. I've worked at this for over 40 years. It's sexual abuse of minors by Catholic priests comes from the top, either by the actions of people who are in positions of power or their permissiveness. And oftentimes their permissiveness is generated because they themselves have a checkered history. The context is culture, the cause is sexual activity from the top down.
and at St. John's uh, Abbey and for the Order of St. Benedict, the abbot is the one that runs the abbey and answers to the Pope, correct? Absolutely. The most important thing about this survivor coming forward is that we now have the chance to see the culture of secrecy at St. John's, that this is part of monastic history, that this is an expression of monk's disease, and it's time for all the other kids that were abused by Abbot Timothy to come forward. And it's time for the Abbey now to come forward with all the names of all the people, both in the written record and in oral history, that they know about. Abbot John, you were my chemistry professor years ago. It's time to change. It's time to follow the rule of conversatio. It's time to be completely open. That's the only way life is going to happen. These kids deserve it. The Abbey must change now. Thank you. Can I ask one follow-up? The St. John's released a statement that I don't know if you had a chance to review it. I know I haven't. Where they express shock at the allegations that have come forward. It's certainly implying that they didn't know about this before today. Well, I'd have to do a little more study, but I can tell you what my preliminary is, my preliminary conclusions, is that Timothy was sexually active. I have no doubt of that on the witness of these people. And he went from a parish, a large inner city parish, to a group of nuns in Crookston. If you look at the history of his assignments, the history of his different places, that is typical of people who get in trouble in one place or another. Uh, my first assignment was in a school where the principal who had been there for many years was transferred uh, to a chaplaincy of nuns. And as the year went on, Many parents came to me about how active this priest was with their daughters. He was uh, the principal or superintendent of the school. He took them on their, their lap and uh, caressed their legs, etc. And then went back. He had history. Uh, he was dean of the prep school before this, a uh, uh, time before. And he used to have the students pull down their pants, the boy students, and he would cane them. You, know, you begin to put the history together, and I have no doubt about the credibility of this man, the clarity of his thinking, and the support of his friends. He has from four to 12 friends uh, who can communicate with him and communicate with him. Yes, I knew about Abbot Timothy, or this happened to me, or uh, Father Timothy it happened. Uh, now, is it hard to come forward? It's very hard to come forward. You know, it's hard to talk about this. This is a sad day for me. You know, I wish none of this happened. You know, this is sad work. But the protection of children and the protection of our sons and daughters far outweigh any sadness that we have to suffer.